when countries are going through war, many people meet their deaths in the name of sacrifice, whether they are whistleblowers or people who hold a lot of power. Maria Huye Katarin was an individual who wanted her country to be independent and to keep its cultures and traditions alive. Tagging herself as a member of a revolutionary group, she thought she was helping to get the freedom her country deserved. However, when her revolutionary group decided to silence her by assassinating her, it shocked everyone. One question remains unanswered. Why did they suddenly decide to kill an important member of their group whose only ideology was to free her own country? Assassination means a premeditated murder of killing someone who is a prominent member, like a head of state, head of government, world leader, politician, CEO, or anyone who might be important or hold a certain amount of power. The article published by New York Times read, Basque separatists kill a pardoned former leader. The article came out on 14th September 1986 four days after the assassination of one of the prominent figures of the resistance group ETA or Uskadi Ta Askatasuna or Basque Homeland and Liberty. Miscommunication and political rivalry, the structure on which this case stands, resulted in the death of Ms. Maria Huye Dolores Katare. Hi, my name is Tanvi. And today we are going somewhere between Spain and France. This case affected hundreds of people. And what's incredible is that this revolutionary group was still active until 2010 and was still killing people. It just feels weird to imagine that they were alive or they were active almost a decade ago. To understand the context of the case, we need to know more about the Basque country, which has an interesting history. Straddling between the border of France and Spain, Basque country, based in the northwest part of Spain and southwest part of France, has different cultures and traditions as compared to both countries. Because of their location, it exempted them from Spanish laws and taxes and had their own language. With a population of about 3 million, the Basque country has seen its bad days. The country was first under the Roman Empire and then saw a series of monarchs under the Kingdom of Navarre. It wasn't until 1515 they became independent and had their own government. But it was in 1839 when the Spanish government abolished their governing body which resulted in the establishment of the Basque nationalist movement and they insisted on having political unity and a separate Basque nation from Spain. After the Spanish Civil War, which started in 1936 and ended in 1939, the King of Spain, Alfonso VIII, renounced the throne. The country became a republic. However, once they declared it a republic, Spain was in no condition to adhere to that situation. The government was short-lived. They performed multiple assassinations to remove the political opponents and violent wars were frequent. Enter Francisco Franco, a Spanish general who led Spain during the Civil War and took the chair to be the dictator as he too thought Spain was not ready to become a democracy. He was not a terrible leader though. He kept fascism and communism away from Spain and helped the country by not getting involved in the Second World War. They considered him to be a careful leader, and overall, during his regime, he turned the country from a third world country to an industrialized first world country, which helped increase the economy to a great level. As everything cannot be cold, 
Franco still had an issue with a small country named Basque. Since Basque was never a part of Spain, until Francisco Franco became the dictator, they did not want to give up their independence to him. In a thesis named The Effect of Franco in the Basque Nation, Kelda Marco states that incorporating a more independent Basque that did not accept any cultural differences caused one of the most explosive drifts between a group of people and a leader in Spain. The Basque community, which identifies as a southwestern European ethnic group, was suppressed by Franco during and after the Civil War. He left no stones untold as he tortured its members, imprisoned families, closed the schools and banned their language. The final nail in the coffin was on 26 April 1937 when he bombed a town named Guernica which belonged to the autonomous community of Basque Country. It involved the bombing of civilians by a military air force and is illustrated as a war crime by some historians. The act resulted in the death of 150 to 1,650 civilians. In 1952, the Basque community formed a resistance group, ETA, Uskadi Da Asakatsuna, or the Basque Homeland and Liberty. They had one goal, to gain independence for the Basque country using any means possible, including violence. From 1968 to 2010, they killed 829 people, including civilians. Like everything in the 1900s, this group contained only men and their attitude towards women was patriarchal and informed by the conservative Roman Catholics, though women's involvement increased in the mid-1960s. ETA might be a terrorist organization, according to the Franco regime, but for the young people of Basque, it was a noble revolutionary movement. Enter Maria Yue Dolores Gonzalez Catare. She was born on 14th May 1954. Also known as Yue, she was an iconic woman leader of ETA. She had eight siblings, and her paternal grandfather owned a grocery store in Ordizia where Yue would lend a hand between school breaks. Yue grew up during Franco regime. There were restrictions on using the Basque language and they also banned their nation's flag. She was 17 years old when she joined ETN in the early 1970s. Initially, she acted in a supporting role, assisting the group, and it was in 1973 that she became a full member. In the same year, she got into a relationship with a fellow member named Jose Ettebaria. Suddenly, he died in Gecko, carrying a bomb that accidentally took off and blew him apart. On 20th of December 1973, ETA was successful in assassinating the Prime Minister of Spain, Luis Carrero Blanco, in a roadside bombing performed by ETA. Reports suggest that Yoye also had a part to play in his assassin, which can explain why she ran away to France. Yoye had to overcome sexism within the ETA. She was expected to play a subordinate role, but was often regarded as someone who had a sense of responsibility. She was determined to take part in the same activities as men. And she did, as she became the first woman in ETA leadership, and as a result, they considered her an iconic figure for her toughness and intelligence. During the last years of the Franco regime, ETA killed dozens of people every year, from Spanish security forces to Basque business owners and civilians. In 1975, after the death of General Francisco Franco of heart failure, the country changed from a dictatorship to a democratic one. During this time, the organization increased its scaling to put pressure on the Basque nationalist parties to not involve in the democratization process. In the late 1970s, Yuri was going through a tough time. A death squad killed her mentor Jose Miguel Benaran Ordenana. 
The leaders of ETA carried out various bloody attacks on civilians, which UAE was not in favor of. She argued and advised conducting political negotiations with the Spanish government, masked political parties, and social movements to reduce the number of killings. Maria felt ETA was only interested in killing and had lost its original revolutionary ideas. And amongst all of this chaos, she fell in love. This gave her a new perspective along with new outlook to create a life outside of the ETA group. After many arguments and threats, ETA secretly allowed Yoye to leave the organization. In 1980, she went into exile in Mexico, where she studied sociology, worked for the United Nations, and had a son named Aquetz. In 1977, Spain passed a law named Spanish Amnesty Law, also known as the Pardon Plan, which allowed political prisoners and those in exile to return to the country and guaranteed freedom from punishment. So, in 1985, she returned to Basque with her father in the city of San Sebastian to connect her son to the country she belonged to. She had notified ETA about her return to the Basque country, news that ETA leaders did not appreciate. For Yui, ETA was in the past. She never wanted to be a part of the organization in the future. She planned to live a life outside of political activism. But the leaders saw her entry into the country as a threat. In late 1985, Cambio 16, a Spanish monthly active current affairs magazine, published an edition where they printed UAS's face on the magazine's front page under the headline, The Return of the ETA Woman. UAS prints believed that the Spanish government leaked the news of Maria coming back to the Basque to the ETA to make them look weak since she was an integral part of the organization. ETA feared that Maria became an informant to get access to return home, who, by now, considered her a traitor and drew graffiti on the walls of Basque country to defame her. In contrast, her friends said she never wanted to publicize her return and never wanted to criticize ETA. Are you okay? Yes. Do you know who I am? I am from ETA and I am here to execute you. This is the last conversation between Yoye and ETA. On 10th December 1986, they gunned her down in the middle of a local fair in front of a three-year-old son, Akets. Jose Antonio Lopez Ruiz, or Kubati, shot her three times, once in her thigh once in her chest, and finally in her head. Akets was still holding her hand when they killed her. He screamed and cried as hundreds of people ran to find a safe place to hide. The police took him to his grandparents' house, and he was told that his mother had gone on a trip, from which she never returned. Once the job was done, Kubati and other two young men who never tried to hide their identities, took their stolen car and drove off to their destination. Despite their car being held up for more than a minute in a traffic jam, they remained calm. The police later found the vehicle, which had a bomb inside. They found no particular evidence from the car, as the car was booby-trapped, and while tampering with the car to get any kind of evidence, it exploded, erasing any evidence it held. On 17th September 1986, ETA issued a statement explaining their side of the story, stating that Yoye was a traitor for accepting the pardon plan, which is, quote, designed to open fissures among the most vulnerable sectors of the Basque National Liberation Movement on the ETA and deliberately weakening it by offering a false and vile personal way out of those who have betrayed themselves. Unquote. She was not the only one who returned to the country under the pardoned law. Around 200 to 500 ETA members during the 1980s were considering seeking pardon because of increased pressure from Spain 
and a former refugee from ETA in France. With a single flower in hand, about 1,500 people joined UAE's funeral procession in Ordizia as a sign of protest against the assassination. The entire population of her town joined in a one-day strike on Thursday, but out of all those hundreds of people who witnessed this crime, only a few came forward to talk to the police as witnesses. Around 70 pardoned ETA members published a manifesto stating that ETA was endangering everyone in Basque and added that the need for no political negotiations can justify the death of an ex-militant comrade for adopting a personal decision. Rui was not the first pardoned ETA member to be assassinated. Her former comrade, Miguel Francisco Salun Angulo, was shot in February 1984. The decision to kill Yoye was one of the most controversial choices in the organization's history. Her version of the story was unknown to many but her friends and families, noting that her departure was misunderstood in the closed world of armed organization to resolve some of the matters and light the choice of assassinating her wrongfully. Her family published her writings by the name Yoye from her window. The Spanish Civil Guard caught her killer, Kobati, on 25th November 1987. They set up an operation under the name Akets and arrested him while he was making a call in a telephone booth in Tolosa. During his first trial, they sentenced him to death for high treason. According to him, Yoya became a myth in ETA, spread her thoughts against fascist-style militarism and got involved with the clowns of a political environment that applauds attacks and deaths. Kubati finally served 26 years in prison for participating in murder. Kubati knew Yoye was a historical figure, one of the very few women who mattered in ETA. Countrymen from her town named Picato or Francisco Garmendia planned to kill her since he also disagreed with Yoye's thoughts. A year before her assassination, during an interview, Yoye said, quote, I was an ETA militant. I resigned because I was tired and was in disagreement with the new members emerging. It's been more than 60 years since I left. I made a life away from the world of politics, working, studying, and now having a son. I have a son and I want to live. I had him because I want to live." Unquote. The country till now has suffered a lot because of the ETA group. Around the time when they disbanded, the country revived most of its language and has become an autonomous community within Spain, forming its parliament and holding regular elections. ETA, whose main idea was to be an independence from the Franco regime and become a country where they can speak their language and celebrate their cultures, disregard any fear, became a terrorist organization that ended up killing hundreds of people. The story of Noye was not the only one who suffered such a terrible fate at the hands of these people. Many such stories have destroyed countless lives of civilians, political leaders and soldiers, all in the name of freedom. If you want to listen to more such cases, be sure to subscribe to Shades of Makam wherever you're listening. You can find images related to the cases covered on the podcast on our Instagram at Shades of Makam. Follow us on social media to receive updates on other episodes and let us know if there is a case you want us to cover. Shades of Makam will be back next week. Till then, take care and be safe.